Good afternoon and welcome to Value Beyond Cost Savings, Unlocking Diversity, Equity and Inclusion with Open Educational Resources, presented by Nancy Hinke, Textbook Affordability Librarian here at the University of Northern Colorado. My name is Stephanie Wigand and I will be moderating this session. So I'll keep an eye on the chat um, and any, make sure any of your questions that you put into chat um, are answered or that Nancy knows about them, but also you're welcome to raise your hand um, so that Nancy can see that and she will um, answer your questions that way as well. So with that, I'd like to introduce our speaker for today. Nancy A. Henke is the textbook affordability librarian at the University of Northern Colorado Libraries, focusing on affordability and open educational resources. She earned her MLIS from the University of Iowa in 2023, and she also holds an MA in literature from Colorado State University. Prior to her career in librarianship, she spent 13 years in higher education instruction at Colorado State University, teaching undergraduate composition and literature courses, mentoring graduate students, um, excuse me, <laughs> and directing the composition placement program. When she's not advocating for OER, you'll probably find her chasing after her four-year-old son or taking care of the 50,000 bees she has in her backyard beehive, which, she, which is ruled by the queen, Beyonce. <laughs> With that, I will hand it over to Nancy. Thanks, Stephanie. Uh, well, welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us today, whether you're here uh, in real time or watching the recording later. Uh, my name is Nancy Hankey, and um, I'm excited to be uh, chatting with you today. So um, one of the things that I wanted to start with is a little bit, give you a preview of um, what we'll be talking about today as well as discussing some of the learning outcomes that we hope you have. So we're gonna start um, by just defining some terms. Um, so we have a basic grounding of what we're talking about when we use specific terms. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about the cost savings related to OER um, so that we can then set up the um, value beyond cost savings. We'll do a little preview of open licenses and what we call the five R's of OER. Um, and then we'll talk about some very specific concrete ways in which OER, open educational resources, can contribute to DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion. And we'll close with some further resources and further opportunities. So hopefully by the end of this session, you will be able to define OER, if you're not already familiar with the term, um, and demonstrate an understanding of the basics of open licenses. Uh, explain how the open licenses characterizing OER can contribute to a more diverse, equitable, and inclusive learning environment, as well as see examples of OER projects that contribute to DEI. Okay, so um, just as a note, Stephanie kind of prefaced this, but please do know that um, in the context of the actual live session, I'm very comfortable with people raising their hands. It comes from having taught for a very long time, so I'm very, I'm totally fine with that. I am not great at monitoring the chat, so any questions or comments in the chat will be addressed at the end, okay? But do feel free to raise your hand in the context of the Zoom um, if, if you have a question or a thought. Okay, so we're going to start with the end, and by that I mean I'm going to start with a spoiler. So the title of this presentation is um, Value Beyond Cost Savings, Unlocking DEI with OER. Um, but the spoiler is that while OER can, quote, unlock the door to more diverse, equitable, and inclusive learning materials, um, they're not a silver bullet. Instructors still need to walk through the door, to extend the metaphor, and simply and do the work to ensure that OER are making these learning experiences more diverse, equitable, and inclusive. So another way of saying that is simply by using OER does not make a classroom or a learning experience more diverse, equitable, or inclusive. It's not automatically so. So um, there is there is work to be done um, to ensure that they are doing that, and that's some of what we'll discuss today. Okay, so we're going to start with some definitions. Now, I realize that this slide has a lot of information on it, but really what I'm trying to do is just honestly be transparent about where I'm getting information from. So this right up here that I'm uh, kind of pointing to in the yellow box, that actually comes from UNC's Division of DEI, their website. And these are their definitions of diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging. And really what I've done is I've just taken the underlines and kind of consolidated them down here to just shorten them a little bit for our context. So for the purposes of our presentation today, we will be using the definition of diversity to mean all the ways in which people differ. And it encompasses all the different characteristics that make one individual or group different from another. 
not only race, ethnicity, and gender, but also age, national origin, religion, disability, sexual orientation, socioeconomic status, education, marital status, language, and physical appearance. And it also involves different ideas, perspectives, and values, okay? So that's kind of an inclusive, um, all-encompassing definition of what we'll be using for diversity. Equity, we will use the, the definition providing resources according to the need to help diverse populations achieve the desired outcome. Inclusion um, is authentically bringing traditionally excluded individuals and or groups into processes, activities, and decision-making and policies in a, ways, in a way that shares power. And our division of DEI also adds the term belonging, um, because the I, that feeling of security and support when there is a sense of acceptance, inclusion, and identity for a member of a certain group. So we will be using these terms um, to discuss um, when we talk about diversity, equity, inclusion throughout today's presentation. I also, it's important to define OER. Different people have different levels of um, familiarity with the term. I use the UNESCO definition of OER, which I've put on the screen for you. So open educational resources, OER, are learning, teaching, and research materials in any format and medium that reside in the public domain or under copyright that have been released under an open license that permit no cost access, reuse, repurpose, adaptation, and redistribution by others. Now that is a fantastic example of a very long academic um, definition. So let's just break it down a little bit. So the first part, learning, teaching, and research materials, pretty straightforward. And it says in any format and medium. So one thing to be aware of with OER is that OER tend to be digital first. They tend to be online. However, they're not necessarily always so. So they can be in any format. And I have an example of an open, um, it's hard to see because it keeps blurring, but this is an example. This is a hard copy textbook and this is an OER. This was published by a nonprofit OER publisher called OpenStax. And so things can be, in hard copy format and still be considered OER. And as well as any format and medium. So a lot of times we think of OER and we think about textbooks of which there are many, but there can be um, all sorts of things that are OER. There are PowerPoints, there are syllabi, there are lessons, there are simulations, there are test banks, there are quiz questions, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So anything that could be used for teaching, learning and research um, that's licensed in a particular way can be considered OER. So um, we'll talk a little bit about the public domain, the copyright issues, and we're going to delve a little bit deeper into that uh, because that's actually a very, very important part of this definition and it deserves its own discussion. Okay, so that's what we're going to be talking about when we talk about OER. Okay, but it's also, I think, important to recognize that OER kind of are nestled within this broader definition of what we at our campus call affordable resources. Um, sometimes at different campuses, they're called free to student resources, um, zero cost resources. There's a lot of different names. But the way that we kind of define it is um, what, what we deem kind of as affordable are materials that are free to students, but not licensed for adaptation or redistribution. So this might be eBooks from library databases, open access articles, web content that the copyright is held by somebody else, but it's still fantastic free to student web content. So those materials tend to have all rights reserved copyright. Whereas open educational resources kind of within this broader definition of uh, affordable resources, these are the ones that are in the public domain or that carry open licenses. And we're gonna talk about this, uh, do a little bit more of a deep dive again, a little bit later in the presentation. And in fact, I repeat this exact slide um, because it is really important to talk about the copyright and the open licenses when it comes to OER. And that's not just a definitional term, it's actually operational in other, in other words, um, the whether something is all rights reserved copyright or openly licensed changes what you can do with it and it changes how it kind of operates for DEI. So we'll return to those um, kind of definitions in a little bit here. So that gets us to these kind of questions. If we're going to take the definitions of DEI and we're going to def take the definitions of OER. So it kind of begs the questions of how can OER incorporate and value the way people are different for diversity? How can OER help diverse populations achieve blank desired outcome? And that's a blank on purpose because that blank could be all sorts of things depending on the context, the class, the assignment, the student, right? Um, that, that what is that desired outcome could be a lot of different things. 
and, and how can OER bring traditionally excluded individuals or groups into course materials in a way that shares power? And that's what we're going to talk about in the context of our presentation today. So my first, jumping from definitions into kind of um, other content, kind of more developed content, I want to talk about cost savings a little bit because cost savings are a good start. And I have it on my bulletin, a good start, but... Okay, so these this data is from UNC from fall of 2021, and it was a survey that asked students about kind of their experience with textbook costs. And the question in the survey was, has the cost of textbooks caused you to, and students answered, and some of these are quite shocking, to be honest. I mean, 19% said that they took fewer courses because of the cost of textbooks. 18% said they didn't even register for a course because of the cost of the textbook. 23% said it caused them to earn a poor grade and some even knew it was caused them to fail a course. So students will sometimes not take a course because of textbook costs. And sometimes they will still take a course even though they can't afford the textbook, knowing that it's gonna harm their grade. Um, and these are kind of the realities that our students are faced with. So even if the only thing that OER did were sa would save students money, it would still be helping in some ways, right? 30% of UNC students are Pell eligible and eliminating textbook costs eliminates a barrier to accessing, uh, accessing education. And that is good, okay? Um, but we also know based on sur survey data and uh, data collected from UNC that OER at our institution, and this, this conclusion is kind of um, re repeated at other institutions as well, is that OER courses actually can help student success because um, a 2021 study um, at UNC showed that um, OER courses had higher passing rates and higher completion rates than non-OER courses. And that's just looking at the use of OER. That's not looking at the content. We haven't delved into DEI issues yet. This is just removing that financial barrier. So 7% higher passing rate um, among uh, courses that use OER and a 10% higher completion rate. So uh, just kind of for um, kind of clarification, a passing rate is um, A, B, all the way down to C minus, and um, D, F, D, F, and W would be considered would be considered um, not passing. And so um, some students might complete the course, go all the way to the end, but still technically not pass. So we have, but but e in either case, we have higher both ha higher passing and completion rates. And when that's disaggregated among first generation students, Pell eligible students, and underrepresented minority students, we can see some clear. Um, we can see some clear um, differences among um, among the success rates for those success rates for those students in terms of completion. So we know that even if we just eliminate the cost barrier, we're doing good things for students. Okay, but free is good, but and that's why we get to um, to kind of really the focus of this presentation um, because if you look into um, the literature about OER, it's really important that we have. Um, Free, but as uh, this author points out, it hardly creates an inclusive environment for students to have free access to materials that may alienate them by not adequately representing them or through perpetuating harmful cultural biases or stereotypes. And um, Valenciana's in 2020 points out that while openness also often assumes equity and justice, higher education faces numerous systemic injustices that cannot be solely addressed by OER adoption. And if we're not mindful, the creation and use of OER could not only reflect inequities, but reinforce them as well. Okay, so, so while eliminating cost barrier, cost um, hurdles is good, um, it's not that silver bullet. That's the spoiler from the beginning of the presentation. In fact, Valenciano's kind of digs a little bit deeper and asks um, those of us who are in this world to kind of critically question um, who's creating OER and who's participating in it. So by asking who creates OER, we might be able to examine systemic structures that disempower certain individuals from creating openly licensed materials. By asking who and who is not represented in OER and are individuals representation in OER appropriate and empowering, we may begin to examine whether OER offer broad, diverse and accurate representations. And by asking who is cited in OER and which forms of knowledge are reproduced in OER, we may begin engaging with the politics of citation. Now, some of these um, are things that I think about myself in the context of my role, and others are those that all of us can engage with, whether we're interested in OER creation or adoption, 
um, in our own classrooms or whether we're kind of creating something to share. Okay, so this leads us into, if we've gotten some definitions, um, we've gotten kind of some um, understanding of free is good and it does help, but right? It's not everything. We can then kind of lead into talking a little bit about open licenses and the five R's of OER. And the reason that I have um, a puzzle piece on this part of the, the, um, the presentation is because there are a number of interlocking pieces that lead to the DEI kind of potential of OER. So um, we'll talk, you know, we have that issue of OER versus other affordable options, which we saw a slide on earlier, but I'll delve into a little bit more. We're going to talk a little bit about public domain versus open licenses versus traditional all rights reserved copyright. We'll talk about the five R's of OER. That's the, the right to retain, revise, reuse, remix, and redistribute. And then um, that leads to this idea of revisions and um, using that kind of power of revision to incorporate DEI into OER. Okay, so this is a slide you've seen, um, but this time I'm going to be focusing on the copyright issue. Now, I will warn you that when I was a faculty member before I became a librarian, anytime someone started talking about copyright and fair use and public domain, I, I'm not going to lie, my eyes just could kind of glaze over a little bit. And I just was like, oh, this is so not my thing. And now that I'm a librarian, I was like, this is definitely my thing. But I realize now that I'm a librarian, how important this is to many of the things that happen in libraries, especially what we're talking about related to OER. Because these affordable resources, and remember, these are resources that are free to our students by virtue of them being students here, right? Access to library collections, or simply because they're free online on the internet. Those are good, and those can eliminate cost barriers. But because they have traditional all rights reserved copyright, they cannot be amended, where open educational resources can, because OER are in the public domain or they're openly licensed. And that's a very important difference. And that's the difference that actually can kind of open doors to um, DEI benefits of OER. So in terms of kind of this idea of all rights reserved versus open licenses, what's the difference? Um, because in all rights reserved copyright, only the copyright owner is allowed to reproduce the work, prepare derivative works, distribute copies of the work, perform and display the work publicly, unless they give someone else explicit permission to do those things. Now, one thing I haven't talked about there is the fair use exceptions. Um, that's a, I feel like that's a little bit beyond the scope of this presentation. Yes, there are some kind of fair use tests you can do um, to use um, copyrighted work in certain contexts, but generally speaking for kind of the broad picture, the copyright owner can only do certain things with their work. Whereas with an open license, it's a license on copyrighted material that allows someone else to use the work according to the license terms. This means that a user who does not own the copyright, but a user can do some or all of the following without having to seek permission. They can retain it. They can revise it. They can remix it with other things. They can reuse it and they can redistribute it. And that's the difference. And one thing that's also important to remember and be aware of is that both kind of traditional all rights reserved copyright and open licenses, they operate within copyright law. In both cases, the original creator ho holds the copyright, even if they attach an open license to it. You're not giving up your copyright if you attach an open license to it. All you're doing is saying that I am the creator of this, I own the copyright, but I am going to make it clear to others what they can also do with it. So they don't have to seek permission. It doesn't stop them from doing specific things. And that's the that's the difference between kind of that copyright and open licenses. So to kind of show you on kind of a, a spectrum, this is showing kind of the difference between public domain, open licenses and all rights reserved copyright. And we go from most open on the left to most closed on the right. So on the most um, most open on the left is public domain. Now things can go into the public domain in a couple ways. Um, a lot of what um, many uh, many people are familiar with is stuff that is old, stuff that is just so old it's no longer under copyright. We can take we can do what we want with Jane Austen's text. We can do what we want with Mark Twain, right? It's just old and the copyright is expired. But there are also some things that cannot be copyrighted, like facts and ideas. Um, and there's also sometimes people 
give their work to the public domain. They create it, but then they dedicate it to the public domain. So when something's in the public domain, copyright ownership is waived. So it's either waived or it's just expired and it's no longer under copyright. And so the author gives away those rights to the public. They're now in the public domain. And so the statement is like, it's not mine. I give up my rights as an author. You don't even have to cite me, although I would appreciate it, right? And that's the most open that we can get. The, cre the open licenses and the CC here stands for Creative Commons, which we'll talk about a little bit. It's a very common open license. Um, this is where the copyright ownership is still retained by that original author, but the author just grants rights in advance to downstream users to do certain things with it. And so the statement is, it's mine, but I do allow you to take my material. No need to ask for my permission because it's already granted, just ensure to make a proper attribution to me. And then we get to traditional all rights reserved copyright, which is the most closed. And that's still copyright ownership is retained by the author. The author does not grant the rights to the public and they say, it's mine. I don't allow you to take this material and repurpose it. You definitely need to ask for my permission to use it. So this is the scale that we're working on at OER to be considered true OER are going to be within this realm of the um, public domain or openly licensed. Now to get a little, it's easy to get too much into the weeds about Creative Commons licenses. So don't be intimidated by what's on the slide. All of this is just to show that there are just various elements of Creative Commons licenses. And you can use those different elements to build a license that then simply tells a downstream user what they can or cannot do with it. So for instance, this specific presentation, these slides, I have licensed as CC BY, so Creative Commons Attribution. And all, if somebody wanted to do something with this, the, this PowerPoint that I've created, all they would need to do to be able to redistribute it, or they can remix it, or they can revise it, they just need to give credit to me as the original creator of this PowerPoint. So um, each of these different elements kind of tells you different things. Um, now, again, it's outside the scope of this presentation to go through all the ins and outs. That's not interesting to most people. It is to me now, but it wouldn't have been to me 10 years ago. Um, but the point is, I think that my suggestion is always, if you come across a Creative Commons license and you don't understand what you can or can't do with it, that's when you ask a scholarly communication librarian. That's when you could ask me, you could ask anyone on our team, um, because that's what we're here for. There's no reason for every single person um, to have to know all the ins and outs. But one thing that um, I think it is worth knowing is that if technically, if these down here are not OER, so if you look at this, this ND here means no derivatives, which means that no adaptations or derivatives can be made. And so technically, if something has that ND on it, it's technically not an OER because it cannot be revised, okay? And that revision is so important because if you are something as a true OER, you can do those five Rs with it, right? You can retain them, you can redistribute them, reuse them, revise them and remix them. And that is, um, to be a true OER, you have to be able to do all of those things with it, which is why things that are licensed as Creative Commons with the ND, um, they're technically not OER. Now, one thing I'll also say, um, just going back to the slide for a second, I focus on Creative Commons licenses. They are truly 99% of what I um, see in my work um, doing work with OER. They are not by any means the only open licenses. They are the most common that I'll see. Um, data sets often have different types of licenses. Software often has different types of licenses. So um, please do know that when I'm talking about these, I'm talking about Creative Commons, but they are not the only open licenses that exist. Okay. So that lets, uh, leads us to this, which is what the five R's let you do. And what the five R's let you do, let you do the things that can open the door to those DEI benefits. So for instance, one of the things that you can do legally with OER is amend existing OER to make the representation in those OER more inclusive. So you can add images and textual examples of a variety of people of different races and ethnicities, ages, income levels. You can show people in both urban and rural settings. You can provide U.S. and international examples. You can show people of different sizes and shapes and abilities. You can show different types of families. And um, that is not to be um, that is not to be undersold, right? The power of an image in a textbook. 
um, or in some sort of learning material. And please do keep in mind, you don't need to be discussing DEI to include diverse imagery or examples. This example, um, that's my image, this is a screenshot from OpenStax, which is the company that publishes that hard copy textbook I saw. This is a biology textbook. And they're talking about macronutrients and they're talking about cellulose and they have a picture. And the focus of this picture, yes, it's a person who uses a wheelchair, but the picture is actually about the cotton candy. And so this is just kind of an indicator that um, diverse imagery can be included in all sorts of things, even if you're not a quote unquote talking about right um, DEI issues. And that th those kind of amendments that you can make to something that already exists when it's an OER can be a powerful way for students to see themselves in the textbook. This is just another example that we have. This is a German uh, OER curriculum, uh, Grenzenlos Deutsch. And one of the things that they have done to kind of increase representation in there is that they have these kind of personas that they follow throughout the textbook to demonstrate all the different types of German speakers who exist in German speaking countries. And so they've included these personas that they that they include throughout the chapters so that so that all so that students who are learning German and students who already speak German, who are learning it, they have an understanding of all the different types of kind of German speakers who do exist. Okay. Now, one thing I'll say is that, again, OER can be amended. If you're going to add um, diverse imagery to an existing OER, which you can do because of the five R's, um, if you're going to add images to OER, those images themselves should also be openly licensed. In other words, not a great idea to just go to Google, do a Google image search, find an image that looks great, but you don't know who owns the copyright, you don't really know how it's licensed, you don't know anything about it, but you're like, hey, this is a great, this is a great picture. Um, a better approach is to um, seek out openly licensed images. And if you're not sure where to find them, I have a whole spreadsheet with websites on how to find openly licensed images, which I'm happy to um, share because it's linked here. It's linked again at the end of the presentation. Okay, So, so that's something to be aware of um, when, when uh, uh, adding diverse imagery specifically to OER. Okay. Another thing that the five R's allow you to do is add local examples that resonate with your specific student audience. So you could change an OER to provide UNC or Colorado specific examples and statistics. And the example here is, this is a screenshot from Colorado State University Pueblo's Spanish program. CSU Pueblo has a full Z degree in Spanish, which means that students from start to finish in their major coursework can never have to buy a textbook. And so the, the Spanish faculty, the Spanish language faculty have created all of these amazing resources that are available to students. But one thing that I love that they have done is that they not only have created Spanish language materials for teaching students Spanish, they've also included in those Pueblo specific cultural examples so that the students not only are getting cultural examples from Spain and Mexico and Colombia and all these other Spanish speaking countries, they're getting Pueblo specific cultural examples of a statue that might be in their downtown talking about that person you know, who is honored in their town with pictures of that statue. And it's a really powerful way to um, to, to honor students' actual lived experiences. They also in these um, in this OER talk about, specifically talk about um, dialects of Spanish and accents of Spanish and the ways in which some accents are marginalized in other contexts. And it's a way of kind of, again, honoring an actual experience students may have had, which is, which is really powerful. Another thing the five R's let you do is translate existing OER into other languages. And that's something people don't necessarily think about a lot. Um, but this is an example of a book that was written in 2021. Um, it's uh, created with a, a Creative Commons license, so licensed with a Creative Commons license. And then um, because of the license, it could be translated into Spanish and was translated into Spanish on a platform called Pressbooks. And so, um, so that then suddenly you have a whole new kind of audience for it of people who speak and read Spanish fluently. And so that's a really powerful um, way to kind of um, make make things more diverse and inclusive as well. So some of the DEI related benefits, a lot of these have to do with diversity, right? And if we go back to that original definition, all the ways in which people differ encompasses all the different characteristics that makes one individual or group different from another. And these practices can strengthen a sense of belonging in a class, a discipline, or higher education by allowing students to see their own identities represented in their own course materials. And that is a powerful thing for a student to be able to see.
So those are a few of the things, but, but there's more. So the five R's also allow you to, oops, excuse me, um, amend course materials. Sorry, I'm trying to move my, move my gallery on, I'm uh, clicking wrong. Um, amend course materials to meet your students' specific needs. Okay, so this has happened to every instructor I have ever met, including me. Um, so sometimes students come into a class and they're already familiar with stuff. You don't need to cover it like the textbook does because they simply know it. You can delete or shorten sections that you know students already know. Um, you can rewrite explanations that you think might confuse your students. That's what this image is. So this is just the stock image, but I added kind of the confused students and something I remember saying a lot of times, sorry, the textbook doesn't explain this concept very well. Think about it this way, right? And so, so that could actually be put into the textbook itself rather than just being on a whiteboard and then put in somebody's notes. And you know, it could actually be in the textbook because it could have been rewritten with your, with your kind of take and your explanation in mind. You can um, further develop sections that need more attention. So so if you know your students always struggle with a specific concept, you can really flesh that out. You can dig deeper into that. And you can even revise materials midway through the semester to accommodate students' needs as you get to know them or to incorporate their feedback. If you do a mid-semester evaluation and students say, I really want more problem sets about this because they really help me, but I, I feel like I need more to be prepared for my test. You can do that. So you can amend those course materials to meet their specific needs. And you can also, um, as a related, you can amend course materials to better align with the course outcomes and the student learning outcomes, the course objectives and student learning outcomes. Because OER tend to have been written for a specific course. So they're written by people all over the country, all over the world, um, but they tend to be written with a specific course in mind and those course objectives. And they may be slightly different than the course you're teaching. And the example I have of this relates to my previous life as a composition instructor instructor. Um, there are a lot of composition OER that exist, but one thing that is true of composition throughout the United States is that some composition courses at some universities include literary analysis, so analysis of literature, and some do not. And the class that I taught did not. So let's say I like everything about this textbook um, that relates to, you know, writing, um, writing, except the stuff about literature is not relevant to my class because I don't do that. I can just delete those I could delete every single one of those chapters. And that in some ways is small, but in other ways is huge because um, simply, even if I as an instructor said, hey, read these chapters, focus on these things. Um, now don't, don't analyze a short story for your first paper. Cause remember, we don't do that in this class. That's a different class was, you know, don't do that. Simply by a chapter existing in the textbook, it could confuse the student. And they might read that chapter and be like, oh, I know what to do for this first assignment. I'm gonna and analyze a short story. I've done lots of that. And so simply by having that in the textbook, but it not being relevant could be a barrier to a student understanding your specific course material, delete it. You make it better align with your course objectives or your SLOs, okay? And the DEI-related benefits, and these a lot of ways relate to equity. So if equity is providing resources according to, the, according to need to help diverse populations achieve the desired outcome, um, this is an equitable teaching practice. It makes those course materials more reflective of what this, your specific students need, right? So one of the things we say in the OER world is that the... Um, you don't make the textbook attach adapt to the class. You make the um, the uh, class adapt to the textbook. And, and I might have said that wrong. In other words, we can make the textbook what we need it to be, as opposed to just the one size fits all that comes from a publisher with traditional copyright, and we can't we can't fiddle with it. Okay. The five R's also allow you to incorporate open pedagogy, which is one of the most exciting things about OER in some in some ways, because this is a term we haven't defined yet. Um, and this is another great academic example, but it's an, uh, an academic definition, an umbrella term that includes the creation, use and reuse of OER, pedagogical practices encouraging peer learning, collaborative knowledge creation, sharing, and empowerment of learners and systemic and structural initiatives to support and embed openness. But a better, simpler way, a tweetable way of saying that is um, open pedagogy is a lot about involving students in the creation of course materials, including OER. Students actually create OER in addition to other course materials. So um, that leads to a use of renewable assignments versus disposable assignments. So disposable assignments is a, is a term coined by um, an OER advocate, uh, David Wiley, um, in 2013, and he described them as assignments that students complain about doing, 
and faculty complain about grading. There are assignments that add no value to the world after a student spends three hours creating it, a teacher spends 30 minutes grading it, and the student throws it away. Now, um, renewable assignments, and that kind of is his definition is contrast to renewable assignments, tasks in which students compile and openly publish their work so that the assignment and outcome is inherently valuable to the community. So it's not just about their own learning, it's about helping others and teaching others about something. So there are so many really cool examples of open pedagogy. So I'm gonna show you a few um, because these are some of the most exciting things that um, I feel like can happen with OER. So let's go ahead and bring this over. Can you see my screen still? Yeah. So this is um, kind of a one that's um, in some ways near and dear to my heart because I used to teach a lot of American literature. And early American literature is very old and it's all in the public domain. But one thing that commercial textbooks, anthologies, literature anthologies do is that they have a lot of great introductions. They have historical context. They have timelines. They have discussion questions. They have all these things that are actually really helpful for students learning the material. But one thing that this specific project did was they have all of those things, but they're written by students. So instead of the introduction to Native American and ethnographic texts, instead of that having been written by a textbook editor, the students researched it the students wrote the introduction, the students created some discussion questions. And so the students learned in the process of doing that. And then they're also helping others learn, right, in the future. And that's a really, really lovely kind of example of an open pedagogy project. So let's see another one. One of my favorites is um, that, I, that I regret that I never did when I was an instructor was um, wiki education. So this is using Wikipedia to, so teaching with Wikipedia. So this is where college and university instructors assign students to write Wikipedia articles, empowering them to share knowledge with the world. They research course-related topics that are missing or underrepresented represented in Wikipedia, synthesize the available literature, and then add that information to Wikipedia. So they are helping make Wikipedia more diverse, more thorough, um, and in the process they're learning, but they're adding value to the community in some really lovely ways. Um, another example that we have here is social annotation. Um, now, there are more than one tool. There is more than one tool for social annotation, but the one I'm looking at is Hypothesis, which is a tool that can be integrated into a number of different OER platforms. And in some campuses, it can be integrated in a Canvas if you have the right kind of settings or permissions or it could be cost as well. But what um, social annotation does is it takes annotating a text from just the students for the students own benefit to sharing with others. So as the student reads Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner, they can comment on their thoughts about it. And then somebody could even respond to that or somebody could provide a link to a YouTube video that helps clarify something. And so it's um, it's not just about the student, you know, making a comment for themselves so they can get a better grade on a test. Um, it's also about helping others, uh, helping others learn. And then the final one that I'll show you is again, one that I find so lovely. This is um, called My Slipper Floated Away. This was written by students at um, Lehman College in the Bronx. And the instructor of the class kind of identified that this specific student population, they were immigrants or the children of immigrants and they were people of color. And so she asked her students to kind of write memoirs of their experiences. And so some of them wrote a memoir of um, my migrating to the United States. Some wrote memoirs of um, living in the specific neighborhood that they lived in. And talk about a powerful experience, both for a student, but also to share with others about the experience of a specific person in the world, right? And sharing, sharing that, um, that value with others. So there's so many really neat examples of open pedagogy projects. And so just some other examples of open pedagogy, students could make tutorials for a topic. They could create step-by-step -step templates of doing homework problems to help future students do them. They could create games to be played by future students in the class to help future students better understand a topic, write test bank questions. They could create a glossary of key terms for a class or an OER. I mean, really the idea of open pedagogy is helping create course materials. And um, a lot of those times, those, those course materials could be licensed as OER so that other people could benefit from them and other people could adapt them even more later.
So some there's so many benefits to open pedagogy. It's really exciting. A lot of it relates to inclusion. So authentically bringing traditionally excluded individuals or groups into processes, activities, and decision making and policy making in a way that shares power. So what does this do? It empowers students and honors their voices. It improves learning materials for future students. And honestly, it sends a powerful message about whose contributions matter in an academic context. Is the only person whose voice matters the instructor or the person who wrote the textbook? Or is it also the students who are co-creating the knowledge as the class kind of is constructed? And that's a really lovely, um, a really lovely thing. So um, this leads to some time for question and discussion, and then I'll take a few minutes at the end to kind of synthesize a few key points and talk about a few resources and opportunities. So do we have any questions or comments from anyone? You do have one in the chat. Would you like me to go ahead and read oh, it? Oh, yes. Would you please? Thanks, Stephanie. Of course. Textbook cost transparency is a fairly new policy on campus. When I was a student, we had no way of knowing ahead of time how much the courses required textbooks might cost. How easy it for, is it for students to know that information now? That's interesting because it's all relative. The answer how easy it is is relative. So if you're comparing it to, for instance, my own experience as well, so much easier than it used to be. However, it does still require that the student know where to go to find that information and how to access it. So UNC, for instance, um, as kind of part of a state mandate, we actually publish the, the estimated cost of course materials. But if you don't know where to look for that, if you don't know where to find it when you're registering or when you're thinking about what to register for, then it's great that it exists, but it's not necessarily helping you. So honestly, one of the things that we've been doing um, in uh, the AOER committee is uh, the registrar's office created a video that shows students how to find OER courses in the registration system. And one of the things that we're doing as part of um, outreach in uh, on the committee is helping students know about that resource. So we're partnering with, we're doing some social media stuff. We're partnering with SGA so that they can kind of get the word out. Because like so many things, I mean, I feel like librarians face this all the time. The information exists, but how do you get it to people who need it, right? And I guess that's not just librarians. That's a lot of people in the world, but um, so it's it's definitely easier, um, but it is also a matter of making sure that the students and or their advisors, um, the people that support them throughout their academic journey can know where to find that information. And that's some of what we're trying to do um, with outreach from the AOER committee. Right, a second question we have in the chat, is there a central place to find examples of open pedagogy? Ah, uh, yeah. So there, um, the thing about, um, mm, there's a couple kind of key resources, I guess I'd say. So the Open Pedagogy Notebook is one that kind of comes to mind, but I believe that that has, is no longer being updated. So what we have, and if you Google Open Pedagogy Notebook, it kind of is static. Um, one of the, so there's, there's not, so there's a couple of places that you can get some good ideas, but in general, a lot of the stuff in the OER world is distributed. It's in different repositories. It's on different websites. Um, it's in different institutional repositories. And um, in some ways that's really frustrating and understandably so for people um, because it would be nice to go to one place and be able to find everything you need about open pedagogy, for instance. But also just because of the nature of how OER are created, um, it's also in some ways some of the power of OER is because there's not just one place that if that one place goes down or it gets purchased or somebody quits or something, then the whole thing kind of is, is turned upside down and people, people can't get what they need. So, so that's really one of the things that I recommend is call on your uh, friendly OER librarian that's me, um, to help you do those things. Um, and we could talk about some specific places, some specific searches um, that that we could do to help you find what you need um, in the various repositories that do exist. I wonder about the possibility for tension between the notion of expertise and authority from the traditional pedagogical position and how authoritative a source created by students might be. 
I saw the examples of discussion questions and materials to be used in class, which makes sense. I suppose that I'm feeling, what I'm feeling is the possibility of pushback against open pedagogy that mm. relies on student product rather than the old school authority. Not mm -hmm. really a question, but perhaps you could share how you'd respond to that objection. Yeah, and that's something that I have thought about too, right? I've thought about this because, um, for lack of a better phrase, we don't want the line, blind leading the blind, right? Um, I don't love that phrase, but the idea that somebody who's not an expert in something um, kind of taking a position and then other students maybe taking that later is like, that's the way this is. And so one of the things that, um, that I would say is that at least in the experience of people I've spoken with, it's not immediately published and not everything is published. That's the way that a lot of instructors I've um, found kind of handle this. So it it isn't just, um, first it isn't a one and done. It's peer reviewed, it's gone through kind of, peer reviewed among students, it's gone through writing processes. And then um, a number of times faculty, I number, you know faculty have worked uh, individually with students to kind of help continue crafting something so that it does align um, with kind of knowledge in the field and that sort of thing. So, so I would guess I would say that, um, I guess I would say that it's not as a lot of the pe open pedagogy projects, it's not as if they're, they're simply written at three o'clock in the morning uh, by a student because that's what students do because I did it too. Right. And then suddenly it's on, suddenly it's um, being distributed, to, you know, as, uh, as an authority um, on this specific topic. It's just not really how the process tends to work. And even when you're talking about something like Wikipedia, um, if you have like Pro truly problematic and inaccurate information in a Wikipedia article, usually somebody will flag it. Now, what does usually mean? It depends on the context. I mean, there's all sorts of kind of different things, but um, but if something is really wrong with a Wikipedia article, um, it'll get it tends to get flagged pretty quickly um, by by other users. So so there's definitely some definitely some kind of concerns there, but also I think it's about in some ways about the learning process itself, because it isn't just about the product going out to the world. It's about the process that you go to get there. And some of that process usually is getting feedback from others and getting your instructor to look at it and that kind of thing. All right, looks like we have one last question about how OER get updated. And if someone has gone to the trouble of creating a more up-to-date or more culturally sensitive OER, from uh, an original one, how do I find the modified one? Yeah, that's an interesting one. So, so that would be um, that. That's another kind of example of one of the the things about kind of OER repositories and things that um, could be could be frustrating because you you find this great biology textbook. Um, but you're like, oh, this feels like there's some opportunities here for something that's a little bit, you know, more culturally sensitive, has better examples before you put the work in. Does that exist already? Right. And that's that's, again, another example of um, kind of calling on the resources of the community, because if a faculty member came to me with that and they're like, this is great, but eh, I'm not loving some of the kind of representations here. Is there something better? That's the first thing I would do is do some searches myself. But the second thing I would do is call upon kind of the collective hive mind available on the open educational resources listservs and see what people had recommendations for. So um, to see it's like, yes, somebody at our institution did update that and um, they did they did do that, you know, um, so that they that those kind of representations are kind of um better or we don't see one that exists but if your faculty member does that please share it with us because i know people at my institution would love to know that too all right it looks like we don't have any further Not questions okay thanks stephanie so i'll kind of close by doing two things first key takeaways so kind of synthesis some things to remember it's the open licenses that allow for the five R's, right? And the five R's are what open the door to more inclusive representation, revision of course materials to meet student course needs, and those open pedagogy projects. And so the open licenses in a lot of ways are really key to what we're doing here, because that does not mean that traditionally published textbooks 
are, are not, don't have diverse, equitable, and inclusive kind of elements to them, right? It could be a really lovely example. Um, however, because of that traditional copyright, there are certain things that simply cannot be done and you can't amend it to provide specific local context. You just can't do that, right? So even the best traditionally published textbooks, and there are very good ones that exist, you just simply can't do certain things with them. Okay. And finally, whenever um, years ago, I was in a social justice workshop and they closed with this statement. Um, it's from a Jewish ethical text. And it's always stuck with me when um, talking about DEI related issues. And it's, you are not obligated to complete the task, but neither are you free to desist from it. And I really love that statement of um, if this is work that's never really done, but that doesn't mean you don't have to do it. <laughs> it's work that we just need to continue to do. And finally, I will say um, some opportunities and resources. Again, sorry, I'm trying to move my Zoom window. Um, always me. That's what I'm here for. Contact me for consultations. I'm happy to help. Um, I have also linked my spreadsheet of websites where you can find openly licensed images, audio, and video. Um, and a lot of those, because the OER community is... Um, uh, OER creation community is really interested in DEI issues. There are some of those that are specifically um, collections of people with disabilities or specifically collections of um, women of color and technology or specifically collections of um, indigenous students in higher education. So there's specific collections um, that are kind of DEI focused. You could also apply for a course conversion grant. Um, they're, we're done with the funding for this school year, um, but we are going to offer those again next year. Yeah, before I move on, Annie, please, please feel free to share. Oh, you just started to touch on this, and it was a question that came to me when you were responding to the earlier question from someone in the audience asking about a more updated um, version of something. Mm -hmm. It sounds like the OER community is both very healthy and active and um, the possibility of finding your people to consult with and to, and to collaborate with is, is um, an important component of this. This is not work that is done in isolation, it sounds like. I mean, yeah. it, is, it is most definitely about healthy community. It is. And that's a really lovely way to describe it. And I will say that from the time I started getting involved in um, the, com the community, I was consistently impressed by people's willingness to share their willingness to help, their willingness to be sounding boards and provide information. And it really is a lovely, it really is a kind of a lovely community of um, professionals and they're professionals from all sorts of um, contexts in terms of we have faculty um, who teach, we have faculty librarians, we have instructional designers, we have administrators, right? We have people from um, different repositories that are all kind of um, helping weigh in and and really a lot of times helping helping people solve problems that are presented to them. It's quite Clearly nice. not only librarians. Not only librarians. There's a lot, there's a, there's a whole, whole bunch of people out there. That's great. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, okay, so uh, you can apply for a course conversion grant. As I said, we're done with the funding for this year, but we will be able to offer those again next year. So look for kind of announcements about that. Um, on May 17th, there is a free Colorado OER conference. It's in Denver at the Auraria campus. And this is not only a great conference because the content is great and the community is great, which we just talked about. It's also great because um, of the current travel restrictions for UNC faculty, it's free registration, you get lunch and you don't have to stay in a hotel. Um, so the only kind of out-of-pocket cost would be mileage. So um, it's a great way to be able to attend a good conference, um, but still be working within the reality of, of kind of budget constraints at UNC. And also, if you're interested in creating an OER or adapting an OER, um, you can apply for a free seat on the Pressbooks platform. Pressbooks is an uh, OER publishing platform. And uh, a number of the screenshots that I showed today were from Pressbooks kind of OER. And the state of Colorado, the CDHE, is sponsoring a number of uh, quite a lot of seats on there. So if you're interested in applying for that, this will take you to a link that gives you the information to do that. So there we go. Thank you very much for coming. I appreciate I appreciate those of you who attended, and um, I look forward to um, you all being involved in OER more in the future because it's something I care a lot about. So I'm glad you're here and care about it as well. So thank you. <laughs>